Nicole, thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, uh, fantastic. Um, Victoria, you're up. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I feel almost apologetic for what I'm about to do, which is I'm going to show you slides. Um, but uh, hopefully you will get some illustrations of some of the things I'll be discussing. Um, so can you see a screen that looks like a big black slide? Yes. Yes. OK, great. Um, so thank you all. This has been really fascinating so far. I feel there's a lot of overlaps that are maybe not even expected by me in uh, seeing all of this. So I wanted to start out by just telling you a little a bit about the kind of work I do. So I am in art, art history and visual studies, and I focus on computational media and digital humanities. So on the one hand, it's thinking about how we use new technologies to transform the work that we do within the disciplines, but then it's also studying the technology itself and um, how it operates and how it affects us. And uh, this question, the prompts we had were really interesting. So the how it started prompt for me was that I started out as a scholar of Victorian literature and culture. Um, and I was very interested in multimodality within print culture, but then also uh, exhibition cultures, et cetera, and trying to think about how to take all these disparate records from the past and put them together into ways of viewing them that uh, didn't completely water them down, but kept some of the affordances of the original media intact. And so say around 2009, I tried to do this with things like making a Google map overlay of this uh, historic exhibition, but then all at the same time, having a team creating a 3D model, but then also using Second Life, which was cool then, as a place to try and create an interactive uh, display space where we took this complex assemblage of cultural artifacts that had been in this historic exhibition and then think about how to convey um, their importance but the challenge was always that there was no one place to put it all together. You know, it ended up always having to be that you'd pick a channel. So, you know, in the case of the Google Maps, uh, we, we were prioritizing the, um, the spatiality of this exhibition as it occurred in London, overlaying the, um, the exhibition platform, but we couldn't really add in all of the content. And then in the 3D model, which at that time was in an immersive cave space, you could think about the exhibition space, but we just didn't have the bandwidth or the capability or the resolution to actually make this display space be um, including the actual stuff that was in the space. And then in the Second Life sort of environment, you know, it's the sort of bespoke space where we could create interactive pieces and have information about them, but you were creating in world all these little objects and artifacts and you lost a lot of the uh, other types of information. So I had this dream, you know, the meta medium dream where you would take all the different types of cult cultural artifacts and then put them onto a database and then remix them into this one wonder wonderful, glorious assemblage that would be some sort of simulacrum of the experience. Instead, over the years, I've moved more towards projects that take various types of archival and historic media and think intentionally about what kinds of channels of representation and exhibition we want to use. This is a different project that was uh, started several years later, which was thinking about uh, taking a collection of historic recordings of folk music in North Carolina that were originally on wax cylinders and doing additional research into the singers of the songs. So rather than focusing only on the songs themselves, also working with students to think about, well, who did the singing and to go into various types of archives and spaces to put those all together so that people could get a fuller sense of what this collection was about. And so we've done various types of things like create uh, an online exhibition that included materials about some of the singers um, and uh, physical exhibitions um, that used typical museum types of ways of representation as well as touch screens and performances. You know, so really trying to think about how all these different media types that are available to us help to bring the past into the present with a richer experience of the complexity of where things came from. So all of that is a sort of background to my main interest in the last several years, which has been in augmented reality and in the ways in which we can think about augmenting space. So I really appreciated Professor Kaza's comments just now about space and place and what those mean now with all of these data layers and information layers. And now adding to that, the idea of how we can uh, insert more of the, the presence of, of the past or interpretive layers or cultural layers into that experience in real time and uh, on location. So some of the types of work that we've done have been things like taking archival images of protesters on campus 
and put them into an augmented reality space so they can appear as these ghostly images that are representing different moments in time um, in which students felt themselves engaged with, with some sort of political process. But then thinking creatively, and this is where some of the aesthetic practices come in, about how to retain that sense of pastness here using black and white photos and making them into these sort of billboards into a virtual space, but that also has this affective potential of making you see that, in fact, this place that you're in now does have this long history of people being engaged in moments of, um, in this case, activism. And part of that is to counter some of the tendency I see amongst uh, people working in digital cultural heritage to be paying a lot of attention to the physical objects and the artifacts and not as much to the people themselves who were inhabiting those places. So how do you bring those two things together? Um, we've done projects that explore various uses of, I, I just said, not only architectural, but also thinking about architectural history, for example, different uh, ways of looking at the history of uh, the Duke um, Chapel and making putting those into AR space, um, but then taking some of that same kind of idea and going into other urban contexts and built environments. So these are images from a project that was about the history of the Jewish ghetto in Venice and trying to think about how all the different modalities we now have of, of archival discovery and representation and reinterpretation, you know, scanning, 3D reconstruction, um, GPS-based mapping, et cetera, can be brought into the space of being in the city. So this project was created as a, a complement to a museum exhibition that was happening um, in a major gallery in um, St. Mark's Square in Venice, but bringing it on site. And then this is the part where we start getting more into the AI potentials. Um, at the time, what we did was uh, we wanted to have immersive overlays on top of the experience of the space so that you could look around and see traces of the past architectures and get some sort of effective response to the ways that things used to be. Uh, at that time in 2016, we did that by making 360 images of the contemporary space overlaying 3D models that we warped and stuck on top of the 360 and then had that uh, geolocated to a specific site. So you could look through your phone and you could see the space and have that sort of illusion of an overlay. So one of the dreams for us for a future of, of AI enabled and assisted um, city overlays is that we could have more of a one-to-one -one correspondence between 3D locations and, um, and our data overlays. And that's something that we're starting to see already in, in Google and, and other places. Um, I'm also interested in the question of physical exhibition um, and its documentation. I think this is something that um, some others are, are maybe interested in here as well. Um, and this is related to the question of digital art history. The, so the history of digital art history digitized, um, which is a topic that we discuss a lot in the ACM SIGGRAPH digital arts community uh, where I'm the chair. And so uh, trying to think about uh, the ephemerality of digital media um, both because it's intended to be that way if it's performative or time-based, but also because the technologies themselves go away. So what are some of the challenges and opportunities we have to be able to do that kind of documentation and sharing? And we probably will hear more about this in a little bit um, from uh, Nancy McGovern. And uh, thinking about how past practices can help us to inform the work that we do today. Um, one last area that I'll talk about before I get into the what's looking ahead is that I work with a colleague at UNC, Joyce Rudinsky and Psychasthenia Studio, where we create art games, where we try to explore some of these questions, um, but from the perspective of immersive and interactive experiences that have a physical dimension, but that are not tied so much to historicity, but to uh, log with those environments. And in some cases, what that means is places that are now almost um, completely denuded of initial structures, thinking critically and creatively, but also carefully about where and when and how we insert, um, in our case, augmented reality interventions. So this is the site of a, of a camp, uh, a death camp, a work camp. So what do you do here that isn't uh, disnification or exploitation, but is actually something that is a good addition? Or do you decide not to? And I think that, that that's one of the underlying questions that we're thinking about in the arts and humanities with all of these technologies. 
you know, just because you can doesn't mean you should, and maybe doing it is actually far worse than doing nothing at all. So to that point, there's a few technologies that are emerging that I'm sure some of you have seen. Um, the first is an example of these holo interactive holograms that were created a few years ago. The project's called New Dimensions and Testimony, and it was done in collaboration with uh, USC and the Shoah Foundation. And so they did these interviews with Holocaust survivors talking about their experiences and then made this sort of elaborate search engine that enables you to interact and speak to the hologram. Well, very recently, uh, many of us know uh, there, we, it's been made much more possible to do things like animate historic photographs. So we have gone, we can go from the, um, an individual interview with a person who intended to be doing this project, who understood what they were getting into, even if not exactly how it would be used necessarily, to the possibility of animating the past in a way that may or may not um, correspond with what the reality of that person was, but you could make the argument that you're doing it for, for the greater good. Um, this image is, is my great grandfather who I threw into the My Heritage application to see what that could look like. And um, as you'll see, um, if you look at the, are you, are you getting the video here? Yeah, so in case you haven't seen this effect, so here he is, so imagine that. So this is a step removed, uh, several steps removed from the application that I was just describing. But then now imagine that we, um, stop, <laughs> sorry, next. Yeah, now imagine that we use some of the other tools that are being used for facial recognition. Um, the first one is the averages of women's appearances from different um, countries. Um, you know, the idea of the aggregate face, the typical face. And then the one on the right is an image that I created out of the, this person is not real website that I then sucked into the MyHeritage application that we just saw with an idea that we could then create this animated figure. And the point isn't that this would be the end point of the work, but that I, as somebody who doesn't know how to do this, uh, can increasingly easily create these kinds of figures and put them potentially into things like cultural heritage applications, you know, with the very good intention as uh, of trying to um, animate testimony, to bring things to life, to create empathy, to create affective experiences that have a political or social kind of benefit of some kind. And so then if I go back to something like the jukebox project that I talked about before, you can imagine things like animating one of the singers um, who was uh, uh, part of the project and taking some of his music, which you may or may not be able to hear. Let's see. Yeah. So we have this ghostly trace of his voice. Can we, should we, or shouldn't we? Can we, should we, shouldn't we actually think about trying to put these pieces together in order to create uh, an experience for individuals who are going into our archive? So there's a lot of moral and ethical questions that are going along with these kinds of projects. In the VR uh, world and the extended reality world, we've tried to think about these in terms of creating productive unease, you know, having the simultaneous immersive effect and also having something that um, it keeps you at a distance from it. And I think that this area is going to be one that a lot of people in arts and humanities are really going to want to help to intervene in, even as we move forward with using these types of technologies. Thanks. Wow, grab um, uh, lots of food for thought. Thank you, uh, Victoria.